Brian Simmons was incredible. Brian Simmons, uh, who has written the Passion Translation, he's everything you want in a guy who's who's <laughs> translating the Bible. Exactly. Just the love of God exuding from him. Not there to necessarily explain to you all the nuts and bolts, just to reveal how much we're loved. Yeah. It was pretty good. We had the honor <laughs> of uh, hosting Brian and his wife, Candice, at River Church. And we did a little weekend kind of seminar thing called yeah. the Love Revival. And that's what this guy's all about. Yeah, He's translating the Bible through the lens of love. And actually, in this podcast, he dives into the importance of awakening to love yeah and seeing everything through that lens of love yeah and very much uh, about union and intimacy this podcast dives into from the beginning where he started translating which was song of solomon mm -hmm. and the romantic intimate nature of the love of god for us yeah that he be? called that the the heart of the bible itself song song of solomon or song of songs as he he translates it is literally in the middle of the Bible, yeah. <laughs> but it's God's heart for us. He dives deep into that. If you ever get a chance to read Passion translation of the Song yeah. of Solomon, you're gonna get a lot more out of it than, <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. Mideast erotica. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is what he touches on. And then, and then from there, we went into women in ministry, how the Bible's been used like a hammer yeah, in so many improper ways when we approach it through literalism. Mm -hmm. uh, so he, he does speak to, he does speak to scripture and the approach to, to take. Yeah. Obviously letting Jesus be our navigator through scripture yeah. and the purpose of scripture. And uh, I, I love at the end, Brian actually starts to prophesy yeah. over us and our audience. Yeah and to pray so you got to hang with us yeah, till the yeah, end yeah, on this yeah. on this one because there's yeah. there's some prophetic nature in yeah. this podcast which i believe is embedded in his translation of the bible itself yeah yeah we get into union and it's just powerful stuff man. yeah this is a good one he's a he's such a kind guy he is yeah after we pushed stop he wanted to reach through and give us a hug and i was like yeah let's figure that out come on man <laughs> i really appreciate Brian, appreciate his work, and uh, it was just a privilege to talk to him. Yeah, you guys are going to love this. Enjoy it. Really glad to have you on yeah. the podcast. Oh, thank you, Jason. Your writing and your work has just played a huge role in our lives. We're so thankful you're here, man. Oh, thank you. You're very kind. Yeah, and Brian, you, of course, did uh, the Love Revival at River <laughs> Church uh, way back in January. Yeah, we had a great time with you. I remember... We were so thankful to have you. Really, really a deposit yeah. of love in our church and uh, really helped shape the culture, uh, which which we absolutely embrace, especially with what you're doing with the Passion Translation. I think maybe that's a good dive-in point here yeah. is tell us a little bit about your motivation for the Passion Translation. Well, my wife and I were jungle missionaries for uh, a number of years in Central America, right at the border of Panama and Colombia. Um, I know I went many times into Colombia without a passport because uh, there, there's no boundary. You know, it's just uh, there's no border there. It, it's just rainforest. It's jungle. Yeah. But uh, it was during that time with the Payacuna people that I got my feet wet with Bible translation and I fell in love with it. I did have a linguistic training and uh, took a Bible translation course, which was so eye-opening. I'd love to teach a course like that sometime myself. But uh, so I, I went somewhat prepared for the translation project and a wonderful Wycliffe uh, translator, Keith Forrester, who's now in heaven, he was the lead translator for the project. And I was a, uh, I helped with that. Okay. I had a, grasp of vocabulary that he did not have, and he was a better linguist than I was. So combined, uh, we made a pretty good team. Yeah. So coming back to North America, I kind of laid that skill set aside, never thought I'd use it again. We pastored 18 years, a wonderful church called Gateway in West Haven, Connecticut, not far from Yale University. Yeah. And uh, while pastoring there, the Lord raised up uh, a number of leaders and I knew the time came in 2008 for me to turn the church over to another leadership team, which I did. 
and uh, they took it and ran with it. And they're doing great uh, even up to this day. Yeah. So I unemployed myself <laughs> and I asked the Lord, you know, what do you want me to do? Right. And I had a supernatural encounter. And for some reason, this tends to really irk my critics. But, you know, it's OK if Jesus comes to Muslims around the world, right. the man right. in white or, you know, he comes through dreams and visits people. But, you know, God forbid he would come to a, a Christian pastor like me. <laughs> but he did. <laughs> yeah. And I had a, a holy, heavenly visitation. Yeah. I don't make light of it. It was powerful. It was life changing. Yeah. And in that visitation, I was given a commission to do the translation. And I always want to hasten to say that doesn't mean my work is perfect. Just because <laughs> I've, I've been called of God to do something it doesn't mean it's perfect any more than any other pastor or uh, you know, whatever you're called of God to do, yeah. that just means that he's going to equip you. He's going to prepare you and yeah. he's going to be with you through it. And I can testify that the 12 years that I've been working now on the project that I've felt as close to God yeah. uh, than I ever have in my whole life. And even more recently, uh, since January of this year, wow! I've just had a personal uh, breakthrough in so many ways. And, uh, you know, we got to keep moving forward. Yeah. Each of us, we, yeah. we, the worst thing for a believer is to think that you already know something mm. when <laughs> we've got to unlearn so many things and then be taught by the Holy spirit. That's so good. So that's kind of my, my background and my desire to translate the Bible then came out of that. And, uh, it's been a wonderful journey. I've been writing for about 14 years, and the way that it started was also a supernatural encounter. And uh, I don't tell the story often, but I always joke that if God hadn't uh, spoken, and, and I've learned that God speaks to us through the language of our understanding, uh, and uh, if he hadn't come to me in that way, it was such an intimidating idea at the time, uh, if he hadn't come to me that way, I probably wouldn't have done it. And I needed that kind of an encounter to sustain me in those early years, especially. None of that means that everything I wrote, uh, I love uh, Chris Valton says, uh, typically he agrees with 95% of everything he's written. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know it's a little different with what you're doing, but but I love that there's room for growth even in, in, in your approach. Yeah. For me, that encounter is how God speaks very much. So was that something that sustained you in those early days? Because I can't imagine how intimidating a task that would have been. Yeah, it absolutely has sustained me. I, I could really measure my life by those supernatural encounters. Yeah. Uh, I would love to have one every single day, but probably that's not the way of faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. Yeah. But, uh, you know, that, that encounter in 2008, absolutely. He promised me when he came into my room that he would help me mm. with the translation. He promised that he would help and he has yeah. kept that promise. <laughs> he's, he's just given me, uh, you know, insights along the way, the Holy spirit. I felt his presence. I felt the breath of God uh, on my face. As I look at the, uh, the manuscripts, I look at the Hebrew and Greek texts. It just, it just comes alive to me. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, come Lord Jesus, come many <laughs> times, you know, we, yeah. we talk about the second coming, but there's no such thing in the Bible as the second coming. Okay. There's no phrase that speaks of the second coming. Yeah. That, that phrase is not in the scriptures like rapture, millennium, you know, uh, things like that. Those, those words are not found in the Bible. It's funny how we make our entire doctrine about the last days around words that are not even found in scripture. Wow. Mm -hmm. So just that would, would tend to push us back yeah. into the word of God. And if you'll look at Jesus long enough, you'll see the twinkling of his eye. <laughs> yeah. And Brian, one of the things that I really didn't know about you, but got to know uh, through your time at River Church was by starting with the Song of Songs or Song of Solomon, you really were making a statement with your own life as to 
this passionate letter. Could you dive into that a little bit? Because then most of our listeners are probably not huge Song of Solomon fans. I don't know, maybe they are, but uh-huh. you actually just kindled such a desire in me to dive into those to capture the heart of God and his love for me. Yeah, it is the uh, heart of God placed in the heart of the scriptures to get into the heart of every one of us. And I made that the starting point because I had memorized the book. It was my favorite. I'd read dozens of commentaries on it. Wrote Candace and I wrote our own uh, devotional commentary on Song of Songs. So I, I thought that's the appropriate place to start. And, you know, just a couple things. Uh, Pauline theology uh, will will get perverted if you don't start at the Song of Songs. Mm, wow. I'm convinced that Paul got most of his doctrinal yeah. teachings uh, from encounters with the Lord and from an open Bible with Song of Songs wow. because of the terms he uses and the, the, the romance of Romans, you know, right. romance <laughs> wow. should be the title of that book, not just Romans. Mm. And uh, it, it really shows the heart of God coming through for Israel, for his people. And, you know, nothing will separate us from that yeah. love. Yeah. Paul writes, and the love baptism that came over me was through the Song of Songs. And I have found that it is not a book of erotica. It <laughs> is not X-rated. And there's not any woman on earth that would want to be told your hair is like a flock of goats. <laughs> and inside your belly is a mound of wheat. And your neck is like the Tower of Damascus. It's just error to hyper literalize <laughs> the song of songs yeah. yeah you just can't do that yeah it is a beautiful symphony of love it, it's it's what moves the heart i mean come on it starts with a cry for a kiss i mean what wow. a, in the bible that starts with you know let him kiss me wow. right right so the hymn is jesus yeah. not solomon this is not one of solomon's a thousand plus adulterous affairs that somehow got legitimized and, and wow. inspired of God in the Bible. No, it's not adultery that God is pointing to in the Song of Songs. It's this divine pleasure wow. that comes to Jesus when we look in our weakness into his eyes and worship him. A glance of love ravishes the heart of Jesus. And then, you know, if I could just take it one more step further, I would I would say that we have forgotten that Jesus Christ is a human being, Mm -hmm. that inside the Trinity is a man. The glorious Godhead includes humanity. (laughs) And this human nature of Jesus mingled with the divine, you know, he is a 200% human being. We don't diminish his deity when we exalt his humanity. Right. So the, uh, the thing we forget is that a human being can be moved with feelings and passions, whether that one is on earth or in heaven. And Jesus didn't leave his humanity. He took uh, bone and flesh with him, glorified, uh, left his blood on earth. But he is every bit a man inside the Trinity. Yeah. The universe is ruled by the passions of a man. Wow. We don't worship a lamb. That's idolatry. Yeah. The lamb of God. It's not a literal lamb. We don't bow down before a four-legged animal and worship a lamb. That's the sin to do that. But it's obviously a metaphor. And this metaphoric, allegorical, parabolic language is the language God has embedded in his word. And if we neglect that, we will do to Jesus, we'll do to the written word what they did to the living word, Jesus. They crucified him because he spoke an allegory. Mm-hmm. He said, destroy the temple three days, I'll raise it up again. Yeah. That obviously was a metaphor. Yeah. It was not literal. Yeah. And because they could not make the jump from literal to allegorical, they crucified Jesus. Yeah. Wow. Wow. I love that... Uh... The song of Solomon was your favorite before you uh, <laughs> before you even started. Yeah, we had Randall Worley on. I don't know if you know Randall, but I do. I'm a relational theologian, so I am. My heart is just coming alive, man. <laughs> while you talk, because it's <laughs> if it isn't about family, as Bill says, Bill Johnson says, if it isn't about family, uh, it isn't kingdom. 
but there's a lot of thinkers, a lot of folks that have been trained systematically to approach scripture that might be a little concerned about, you know, well, what is love? What, uh, but I love Randall, you know, Randall's a, a wild thinker and isn't afraid to have a thought that maybe is outside of, of uh, what makes people comfortable. And uh, he said, you know, if you love Jesus more and you love yourself more and you love your neighbor more, you're on the right road. I think, and I've said this to, to Derek often, I think right now we are in a, in a place in our culture, in our Western thinking, where our approach to scripture, our literal approach to scripture, our approach to its inerrancy, these words um, have actually uh, become roadblocks to experiencing mm-hmm. intimacy or experiencing the love of God. And um, I love that that we're not even having that conversation. This all started out of a love relationship. I know you must get a lot of pushback because uh, you're you're actually uh, paraphrasing and interpreting scripture. So I imagine you you've probably heard everything. But what do you say to someone who is concerned uh, with with what you're writing and concerned with uh, this love approach, this relational approach? Well, uh, it's it's hard to defend uh, love. You just let it go. You you release it. Yeah. And uh, I take communion every day, and part of my communion with with the Lord is uh, forgiving anyone who has spoken against me or about me yeah. and, and that I also would have my heart cleansed, my lips cleansed from anything I have spoken uh, about another person. Yeah. Uh, but I think the Bible is so rich. It is a treasure. Yeah. And my concern is the hyper literalization mm-hmm. of scripture that we want to hyper literalize right. what obviously is metaphoric and that when you open that door, that gets scholars, you know, panic attacks because the uh, historical, you know, contextual interpretation of scripture is is like a, a god on a pedestal to them. Yeah, yeah. But when you begin to unwrap stuff, you know, like like uh, the lame, the people that were sick at the pool of Bethesda, they were under the five porches. That's the five books of the Torah. It is the law. They're under the covering of the yeah. law, and they didn't. There's no healing in the law. Mm-hmm. It's guilt and death, and and there they were, sick, under the covering of the five porches. But here comes grace on two legs, and and sets them free. Sets this one man free from his yeah. lame inability to walk, pleasing to God. Wow. So when you when you take John nine, or you take you know the woman at the well, and you open up these beautiful narratives and you look past the the shell and you you crack it open there's such life-giving truth and revelation waiting for us the the word has become a hammer to to some people and um, right uh i i think of it there are some hard to process things you know i'm i'm teaching a course on hebrews and i'm at uh, chapter 5 11 it says you know there are many things that we'd like to say, but you're dull of hearing. And mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Uh, there's more to say on this topic, and the topic has to do with the Melchizedek priesthood in the context. But wow, h- how we hear is every bit as important as what we're reading. Wow. And I think the heart that is broken before God, right. tender, teachable, right. not in a sense of pride. I already know that. Yeah. I can quote John three sixteen. You know, I know God loves me, but no, to really get baptized, to get drenched in a cascade of glory, yeah. when the yeah yep. when the love revelation begins to pour into you, this love theology is the key to the great harvest of the nations. Yeah, if we can just begin to unwrap this uh, not Western mindset of love. But the, the truth of love itself, <laughs> uh, the uh, Aramaic word for love is a homonym that means to light a fire, to kindle a flame. Wow. And, and when Jesus said to Peter, do you love me? He didn't use agape and uh, right. the Greek text because he d- didn't speak Greek. Peter, as an Aramaic speaker, a fisherman, uneducated, unlettered, which meant 
they'd not been Hellenized, they'd not, they weren't Greek speakers. He used the word huba, do you huba me? Do you, mm-hmm. Does your heart burn with love for me? Yeah. And uh, the Hebrew word chesed is the most beautiful word in the Hebrew language. The word for unending love, faithful, loyal, <laughs> covenant love is God has to love you. If I know that sounds funny to say it that way, but he has to love you to be God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he it's almost like he wouldn't be God if he didn't yeah. love you intensely, powerful. <laughs> and then the Greek word that we all know, agape, comes from two verbs. And one is to to lead like a shepherd. And the other verb is uh, t- to the place of rest, yeah. to go to rest. Yeah. So it's the, this resting in his love that yeah. John writes about, that we can rely upon the love of God. Yeah. So I, I hope uh, all of our listeners will will look for the gold in every Bible text that will uncover that love theology. And your love is revival. Hey guys, I'm interrupting this podcast for just a minute so I can invite you to partner with us by giving to a family story. A family story is a 501, a nonprofit, and it's our ministry. And it's what allows for me to produce this podcast and other regular content. We've been living this faith journey for a long time, but 2014 was when we officially stepped away from the traditional pastoring approach to full-time ministry. It's been fun. This journey has been wild. And this last year was no less faith-inducing with COVID affecting travel and speaking. And it's been good because, hey, we started a podcast. Our passion is to create content catalytic for an encounter with the always good, transforming, reconciling love of our Heavenly Father. And so our heart through this ministry has always been that through speaking, writing, film, and music, we're relentlessly sharing the goodness of our Father, the good news. Your giving goes directly to support this podcast, as well as written content, discipleship content, teaching small group messages, articles that we release weekly, and also the book I'm writing. I'm excited about what I'm chasing down right now. We appreciate all the support, whether it's sharing, writing a review, following us, signing up for our email list, or financially. We just love being on the journey with you. If you want to give to A Family Story, you can go to afamilystory.org, afamilystory.org, and click on the Give button. All right, thanks, guys. Let's get back to the podcast. you mentioned that uh and it just brings to mind psalm 23 which (laughs) you did a phenomenal job with psalm 23 i think it's one of my favorites in uh in the passion translation uh but one of the things i think that i'm finding in our culture now is either a hyper literacy for the bible or a complete dismissiveness of the bible and one thing that i found that i'm getting traction with people these days in both sides of that, is to say, man, I love the Word of God, and I like my Bible too. (laughs) And because it brings it back to the emphasis on Jesus, it brings it back to the fullness of what this is all pointing to, what this is all uh, accentuating is God in the flesh, Jesus, the one that became one of us to rescue and deliver all of us. Absolutely. And so, um, that emphasis then just brings it back to the original purpose. And I really, I think that's what I think passion translation has really done for a lot of people. I know it's done it for me, for our church, for our family. Rick Warren, I think said this years ago, people asked him, what's the best translation of the Bible? And he's like, all of them. He goes, use whatever translation you can <laughs> use, it. use all of them to emphasize this Jesus that we love so much. And so whatever gets it across go for it. Um, Absolutely. And, uh, and I appreciate that about, about you, Brian. And uh, you know, one of the things that you mention in Colossians, in your translation, you say that love is the mark of true maturity. And, you know, it's really struck me lately, you know, we attribute maturity to maybe someone that can memorize a lot of scripture or but then they use it to hammer people with. They, they like the table flipping Jesus more than any other Jesus uh, around. <laughs> and then, then you've got, you know, the, the person that may 
may pray or have a, a rich, strong prayer life, but they're they're not in relationship with anyone else. And, you know, love coming back to love as the basis for the mark of true maturity, that has just been our quest and our goal. Could you could you speak a little bit to the kind of literal C in scripture that I think we're we're struggling with right now? Um in fact there's been a big Twitter blow up about it recently, and it goes back to the women, the women in ministry question, and the literal nature of this verse that has begun to really push women down and been used to push women down, and it seems like that's that's something that people are really taking sides over right now, like as we're talking. Well, I'm definitely taking the side of of uh, my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. And every anointed a woman yeah. a, a gifted of god and of course uh it, it really goes back to genesis help meet the king james help meet really confuses people and then when you realize uh, that ezer konegdo is the hebrew uh, phrase and it's used god yeah. is the ezer our great ezer that is a helper 18 times god is is uh, the word used for the woman is used for God. So yeah. why don't we make the woman more godlike? Yeah. You know, uh, not that it should go to their heads, but they're like God. I mean, mm. they have a godlike quality yeah. that the men do not have. Yeah. And that's why he separated her from him. And everybody knows he took the best half. And <laughs> women are not a riblet. They're not a part of Adam. God split the Adam ha, mm. and formed uh, from him, a doubly refined individual called the woman. And the only twice in the New Testament where Paul has any kind of even close to a limitation placed upon women, only twice. And they were both to churches that had temples of Diana, mm -hmm. which was a uh, female based cultic uh, prostitution was involved. And all the priests of Diana were women. It was a very heavily you know tilted uh woman led uh cult so when these newly converted women came into the gatherings they would assume that coming out of that background that the women were the leaders so paul is saying to the uh, uh ephesus and then corinth he's saying to the newly converted women to you know chill and just learn and mm -hmm. grow so I put uh, that, I made it explicit in the translation that it's not telling women to shut up. He's saying the newly converted women. Right. Just like he would say to the newly converted men, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to grow in the things of God and don't assume a leadership position until you 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 qualify for that. Yeah, basically they were taking that matriarchal yeah. uh, mm -hmm. society and culture and just kind of like, parlaying it immediately over into their life as new Christians. And Paul was saying, Hey, wait, wait a second here. Let's hold on and let, let love lead this whole thing. Um, of course, Derek, I mean, it, it, it's, it's like, you know, it's like they put women not teaching on the same category as the deity of Christ. You know? Right. <laughs> we believe in the Trinity. We believe in the deity of Christ and women need to not teach. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It and that, yeah. That's just so silly, you know, then you need to put a, a, a doily over their head. Yep, the head covering. You know, if you're going to do that. So it's there's some cultural implications of the scripture mm -hmm. that if you ignore them, then you're going to end up in error. You're going to end up with that harsh, brutal, you know, yeah. uh, my way or the highway. There's only one way to look at scripture when in the Hebrew mindset, no, no, no. There's lots of different ways yeah. to look yeah. at scripture. And uh, it's so important that we... I love that, that the, you know, I love God's word and I like the Bible too. <laughs> yep, that's it. Not to mention that, you know, Jesus commissioned, ordained, sent, and authorized a woman to be the first to declare the resurrection. And so uh, I just, I kind of felt like we should speak into that a little bit. And she was not a prostitute. Yeah, right. Yeah, Mary Magdalene is not a prostitute. That That was traced back to the 6th century AD to a Pope's homily where he mentioned that but nowhere in scripture does it say that and you know everybody says well she had seven demons well i've, I've met some people who had more than that uh, <laughs> in church so uh you know mary magdalene does get a bad bad rap and so many 
precious women of God that have, I'm in the kingdom because of three godly intercessors, women who yeah. prayed me into the kingdom of God yeah. and had influence in my first year or two of my salvation really fed me and taught me. So I'm the fruit of the discipleship grace that was on these three uh, elderly women that I'll, I'll meet in heaven again in the re reunion one day. Yeah. But and then my precious friend, Jill Austin, that came to our church and just blew it up and just mm. she carried such a fragrance of Jesus. And so I, I, I think some of God's best men are women. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> love it. Well, I know your, your wife, Candace, has such a amazing impact uh, everywhere she goes with you. She um, maybe our listeners don't know this, but she's a dreamer mm -hmm. and she dreams a lot and has a pretty rich vision dream life that is uh, um, really blessed our church, blessed me and Sarah tremendously. So uh, absolutely appreciate. Yeah, appreciate your wife. Candace. She's a jewel. And I think to dishonor women and to say that they cannot minister is not only putting half of your over half of your army on the sidelines but it, it just goes counter to the heart of god uh to our yeah. to our life here in the western world mm -hmm. i mean not that scripture cannot direct us in a contrarian you know direction i understand that but it, it just doesn't fit the God of, of love and glory that we're going to yeah. put duct tape over the mouths of our of our mothers and our sisters and our daughters. Mm. Yeah, and it doesn't it doesn't fit. You know, I, I, I appreciate and so value you and anyone who's parsed through the context and and the historical uh, understanding and the language and. And, uh, and yet I can also just simply sit here and go, love doesn't work this way. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I've, when I was pastoring and uh, I was a family pastor and I, I don't know how many fellows would come to me and they didn't know much scripture. They, they didn't hardly know any, but they did know wives obey your husband. <laughs> and, oh. and, and I, and I would find myself at a loss because they were there with a broken relationship. Mm -hmm. And it was the simplest thing to say, Hey, if you understand uh, that husbands lay their lives down as Christ loves the church. Right. If you understood the nature of love, if you understood that love is always sacrificial, that love is is what Jesus did on a cross, then uh, right. you wouldn't be here in the first place. We, right. You know, and yet Scripture, that literal approach to Scripture, and that that supersedes so often right. the realities of intimacy, mm. the realities of love. For me, at times when I hear this conversation and it gets, I'll say this, I sat at that, in that time I sat in a meeting, I'd been brought in to help bring clarity to a, a, an issue. I didn't know what it was till I got there, but the senior pastor, the campus pastor and myself were there with three elders. And the issue was that um, the Sunday before one of the women had prayed from the pulpit and, and, and uh, it offended these fellas. And, uh, but did she have her head covered? Uh, she didn't have her head covered. Dang she, it. <laughs> and I, I was first shocked that I was there. Uh, and then I was annoyed because primarily there were six men in the room and no women. Mm. And, and what mostly annoyed me was that for an hour, they parsed scripture. So when the time came, I was finally asked to talk. My primary point was, guys, uh, there's six of us. We're all married. Why don't we try this again with our wives in the room? Uh, I, I could care less how much scripture, you know, you've missed the whole point. For me, this conversation is one that makes no sense in the context of intimacy, in the context of relationship. When you have a wife and you're in union, when you have daughters and you watch them thrive, I, I think it's not rocket science. And I think scripture can actually be used at times, like you said, as a mm -hmm. hammer um, for control. Anyway, that's my two cents. <laughs> you know, I, I love what you're sharing. And you said earlier that you're a relational theologian. And that's exactly how we need to interpret scripture. And, yeah. you know, I started by talking about Song of Songs, the heart of God. If you get his heart, then you will, you know, we don't have emoticons in the Bible. <laughs> so we don't, you know, you have to, you literally have to have a love lens on your heart to read scripture. And then you'll read it the way God has, has written That's good. for us to feed us, to yes, correct us, rebuke us when we need it. And, and, uh, you know, you've never been corrected till the Holy, yeah. 
Holy Ghost corrects you, and, and you know exactly that feeling, <laughs> like, oh no, Lord. Yeah. But this, you know, love with skin on. God, God put skin on and came to the earth and and demonstrated the great love that He has for us. He didn't just talk about it in a theological, abstract, you know, distant. Uh, format he literally came face yeah. to face with fallen human beings didn't hesitate to touch lepers to yeah. go to Amen. the worst of the worst yeah. and and have dinner with Zacchaeus the wee little man you know <laughs> and, and that everybody despised yeah. it's almost like he Jesus was rubbing it in it's almost like he purposely <laughs> wanted to expose the self-righteous pharisaical yeah. attitude that you know, we're better than other people because we have a Bible or we have Bible seminary or Bible knowledge or yeah. can quote verses. But, you know, I, I actually memorized half the New Testament and was a lousy husband. Wow. I had to learn to love wow. the first three years of my salvation. I'd memorized 17 books of the New Testament, had chart and every day. I, I, I tried to do about eight to 10 verses a day of scripture memory. And I, I God wired me for that. Yeah. So, uh, but I didn't treat my precious wife the way she deserved right. early in our marriage. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we're, uh, we've been married 49 years and I say, uh, 48 of them have been really fantastic. <laughs> and the only reason yeah. that 49th, it was actually our first year yeah. and she was, she's angelic. She is, uh, she's like snow white. She's just pure, yeah. innocent, yeah. glorious. Uh, and I was, a jerk. I was 20. I, I had to learn to love. I had to, I came out of a drug background and to treat her with that kind of dignity, it, it had to grow in me. Wow. Uh, even though I could quote the book of Romans. Right. But, uh, you know, so I, uh, of all people, I know for sure that the Bible minus love equals false teaching, uh, false living, wow. and it fosters an anger in the soul of man. Wow. So the love revelation, the love theology, especially the bridal theology that, you know, it's not good for the son of man to be alone, mm. that he wants a partner in the Trinity. He wants, you know, we married up way up mm. and <laughs> this uh, revelation of, of, of almost as though the Trinity was enlarging. Yeah. to make room for a bride, a yeah. holy look-alike partner that lives and loves like Jesus, mm. represents him in every way, bright as the sun, fair as the moon, majestic as, as an army with banners, that radiant bride that Paul says Jesus isn't coming back until he sees a radiant bride on the earth. That word radiant is in doxos, uh, a Greek word, and it means to be in, it means glorified to be infused with glory. Yeah. So a glorified bride must arise. And that means love, bros. Yeah. That means just loving yeah. Jesus <laughs> with with every ounce of our being. You know, when it says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, that, that means passion. That means yeah. energy. Yeah. It's not just uh, sitting back in a passive way. Love is yeah. a verb, you know. And yeah. so we, we, we passionately embed our heart into his. And when we do, uh, it changes us. So we look at people differently. That's right. We, we treat them differently. Wow. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know, um, I know your time is valuable. I want you to finish this up in your translation of Colossians chapter one, when Paul talks about the divine mystery um, and this mystery of you, you say it this way, living within you is the Christ mm -hmm. who floods you with the expectation of glory this mystery of Christ embedded within us becomes a heavenly hev heavenly treasure chest of hope filled with the riches of glory for his people. But then it says, God wants everyone to know this. So it's not just, the, there's, no, there's no insider outsider in that. How inclusive is this finished work of Jesus? You go on in translation of chapter uh, one, verse 28 and 29, Christ is our message. We preach to awaken hearts. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about the the thought process behind the translation of that Colossians passage, because uh, one thing that we've been embracing on this podcast is exploring the 
no separation between us and God because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. And that the desire of God is that all be saved. This mystery of Christ embedded within us, who does that apply to? Well, to those that have been born again, you know, we when we have experienced the new birth in Jesus Christ by by water and by blood, and we're literally born into that kingdom. Uh, you know, we can't see God until we we uh, have our hearts purified by grace. So uh, the the truth is this: Jesus Christ died for the the sins of the whole world. He took sin and sins and sinner. He took all three dimensions. He took our the sin itself, the principle that that mo- motivates people for darkness. He took the guilt of the acts of our sins, and he took us the the factory, the sin factory. He took us and crucified us mm. with Christ, and that happened before the foundation of the world. Yeah, uh, it says that he chose us in love. Ephesians one four. Uh, before the world began, he chose us. And that word eklegomai for chose, uh, chosen is uh, literally, he, he made us a word from his mouth. Hmm. So the logos, eklegomai, there is a, our being called and chosen by God means that he puts a word in us to speak to the nations. But the, regarding the Colossians, yeah, the he wants the whole world to know the mystery of Christ within us. That there is a glorious Christ that comes uh, to live within us uh, by His Spirit. Romans eight verse nine. We have the Spirit of Christ in us, and this embedded glory has to be unwrapped and presented to people. Uh, it is a finished, completed work. We don't add anything to it. We can't subtract anything from it. Uh, it's just impossible to like exaggerate how glorious uh, the work of Christ. Every day as I take communion and I hold the bread, I, I, I'm starting getting visions. I'm, I want to uh, trances going into a visionary realm of the cross and, and hmm. the mystical glory of Jesus crucified hmm. yeah. for me and, yeah. and the, the beauty of the cross. I never th- would think that there's beauty there, but, Jesus is beautiful in his life and he's beautiful in his death. And, and to present that gospel message, the good news, it's the most wonderful news the world's ever heard that you are included in the love of Jesus Christ. Right, yeah. And you can, we, if you think about it, we all came from God. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. we, he spoke a word and we became that manifestation of the word he spoke and we've given our parents gave us a name and everything but in our life record in our dna there is the revelation yeah that uh, of who we are in christ that we can we can live in him we mm-hmm. can move in him and we can even have our very being in him yeah he that is joined to the lord is one spirit first corinthians six seventeen, one spirit with jesus you know so the union is complete. Yeah. When he said it's finished, it's not only the work of the cross, but it's the perfected union mm-hmm. that he has given us. Yeah. I've been prophesying lately that the next thing God is going to unveil is not identity because we've, we've been stuck there, you know, and it's good. Yeah. Uh, getting our identity yeah. as it's, you know, a son, yeah. leave the servant thing to be a son, a friend to be a son, but even to be a bride. Yeah. But the next thing is is union, <laughs> that a glorified union yeah. with Christ under the apple tree. There I conceived you, you know, that that precious union wow. with Christ that no one can separate. No one can mm. pull us apart, not things, um, you know, things uh, present or things future. He doesn't even mention the past <laughs> because we don't have a past. Wow. Our past ended with three nails. We only have a destiny, not a history. Wow. So this love inclusion is powerful, that his cross is my cross, his empty tomb is where I was buried, and his resurrection is my resurrection. And to know that we're in him, that's, is it 45 times I think it's found in the book of Ephesians? Hmm. That's like uh, eight times per chapter, in Christ. So... (laughs) 
that's the message that I live for and would die for. Yeah. Oh man. Beautiful. That's what I'm writing right now. And, uh, the disciples asked, asked Jesus how to pray. And we call it the Lord's prayer, what he taught them, but the Lord's prayer that, that I've been passionate about for the last few years is the one where he prayed. I pray that you would be one, right? That she would be one just as I'm in the father and the father's in me. So too, that is the, the burning thing inside of me. I, I was writing today, you talked about a metaphor and Jesus talking a metaphor. I was writing about the, the, the Mount of Transfiguration, and as he's coming down the mountain, you know, he's had this powerful encounter, and he comes down, and he meets with, with the father who's got a son who's uh, pressed and being thrown into the fire, and, and uh, Jesus looks around, and, and I don't have it quite in front of me. I know he's, there's different ways, different translations, it could be pretty harsh, that he's, you know, how, how long must I be with you? And he looks around at, at this broken transactional mind, and he's just been uh, in this beautiful expression of union, you know. And then he casts the, the demon out, the boy's healed. And later the disciples ask, why couldn't we do it? And, and I think, man, what a, that's the question, right? But it's such a transactional ask. It's such a measurement-focused question. And, and then Jesus does this beautiful, this is what I'm writing today. Sorry, you caught me at, at, in the middle of what I'm... Oh, I love it. <laughs> but Jesus, he wrote, he said, you know, uh, you have so little faith. And, and you would think you would think he's talking about a measurement, but he's actually, the next thing he does, throws that all out the window because he describes all you need is the faith of a mustard seed and you can say to a mountain, move from here to there, nothing will be impossible for you. And and so I, I what I'm writing about is I'm like, he wasn't describing a measurement. He was describing his union. He was describing his intimacy. He was describing his oneness. And he, it, it wasn't about size. It was a measureless revelation because love does ha, doesn't have a beginning. It doesn't have an end. Love is measureless outside of time and space. In, outside of, of a finite thinking, he was speaking to finite thinking, speaking to time and space, inviting them into that uh, Ephesians 3, 16 through 19, measureless revelation mm -hmm. of yeah. the love of God. Wow. Union. This is the thing, man. It's what's burning in me that we would be one. Come on. That, that we would live as an expression of what Jesus revealed was possible. One. I think you're right on it. I'm excited about it. One with the three in one. Yeah. It's just so awesome. You know, in a <laughs> sense, he comes down that mountain. He's just been in divine mystical union, glorified in that way. It comes down mm -hmm. and there's a father with a son. Yeah. It's like the father has other sons, you and me, yeah. that keep falling into the fire. And, and yet, demonized and yeah. and he comes to set us free yeah so there's a picture there and the kingdom you know that if you have faith you can say to the mountain well the kingdom of god is that mountain you can say to the mountain go to the sea which is humanity the sea of humanity oh, so good. cast into the sea and take that kingdom with you to the nations wherever you go and uh that's that's a beautiful passage and i love the way you're you're writing that. Please let me read it when you're all done. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I'll pass it along. Uh, it's obviously uh, burning in me. That that's the message. That prophetic thing that you're declaring. Uh, I think that's um, that's what we're chasing down. What we're yeah, passionate about it. is that people could know that love, the God that never separates, the the God that never leaves us. That, mm. that we can make our bed in Sheol and He's there. You oh know? my. Yeah, and when Jesus continues in that prayer to say that they would know, Father, that you love them as much as you love me. Yeah, the whole I think world. a lot of people yeah. have faith that God loves Jesus, but they're not so sure about whether or not he loves them. And when Jesus prays, no, I, I want them to believe that you would love them, that they would know you love them, Father, as much as you love me. I just tell people, hey, listen, <laughs> if you can't believe that yourself, at least believe Jesus' prayers get answered. Yeah. That's one that he prayed <laughs> because when we know the love of the father, we see everything differently. We see people in their intrinsic value. Yeah. I think the fact that the incarnation itself, God became human, proves his value of humanity, right. uh, how much he loves us. And yeah. so yeah. Uh, I just love the job that you're doing, Brian, yeah. you and Candace in uh, spreading this message, not just through passion translation, but through your voice, your heart, the prophetic nature of your your lives and ministry, we are so grateful for it yeah. and uh, so yeah. thankful to have you on, yes, on today. Thank you, Derek and Jason. You're both so kind. Yeah. 
And you're both so anointed too of God. I just see the glow of heaven on your lives and greater grace is coming. We go from one level to another level and that glory is just going to be taking the two of you into new realms and your families and your loved ones and your ministries are going to be supernaturally blessed of God. Hey, we receive yeah, it. Oh, amen. Now, now that we're on the topic of glorious things, let's talk about tacos real quick before Brian has to get out. Sure. <laughs> we got to ask you about tacos. <laughs> well, I got to stop at Taco Bell here in a minute. But, uh, uh, I'm, I'm probably one of the few people that's not ashamed to say I like Taco Bell. Come on. But, hey, I love it. You're the first that's actually said it without any shame. But uh, oh, I, I, shame free, the shame free place. It's glorious. I just cleaned out the, the, the glove box of my car and there's so much taco sauce in there. For taco Bell. Oh, yeah. Come on, hot. The hot sauce is, is good. You know, yeah. our daughters, uh, Charity and Joy, they're only about 14 months apart and they both worked at a Taco Bell. Oh, and that's... my taco story is theirs where they would get into like these really cool food fights. They'd stay to the, they had to close, right? They were the closers for the store and they would like these tubes of sour cream and guac and, and all this stuff. And they just have all these crazy food fights. And then they'd end up staying two more hours extra just to clean it up, <laughs> but they loved it. And that right. bonded them, I think as sisters. Right. So that's, that's my, I'm borrowing their story for that one. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a good taco story. That a, is. A, a bonding around tacos. A food <laughs> fight. I love it. <laughs> Zero shame in, run, in running for the border now. Exactly. There you go. Hey man, come on. <laughs> On the border, baby. Every taco is a good taco. I haven't met a taco I didn't love. So Even fish tacos, we'll take them. That's right. Uh-huh. Exactly. Is there, um, is there, where can we find you? I, I, if you want to share, I know you're on Twitter. And- yeah. Probably uh, passionandfire.com is our website. Yeah. Uh, I like to say I'm passion, my wife's fire. So we got passionandfire.com. And uh, you can find yeah. out all about us there, what we're doing, our calendar. Uh, we take trips to Israel every year. We'd love to see everybody join us for that. And, wow. um, you know, we're involved in touching the nation. So the translation is a huge part of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah huge huge part of it yeah but yeah. uh but there's other stuff that we we do as well yeah well i know you have something pressing on you for time so we'll let you go here but i just so grateful mm-hmm. um so grateful I, i'll have everything up where people can find you also your twitter i know you're you're active there and uh it's a really good follow uh very encouraging a lot of what you've shared here um just thankful um could you just pray a blessing over yeah yeah Thank you, Father, for that beautiful prayer of Jesus, John 17, that we are one with you even as you are one with the Father. And I ask that glorious union to be revealed and manifested to Jason and Derek and everyone listening to the podcast. Lord, that you would invade our space, you'd come into our homes, you'd touch our families our loved ones, speak in the dreams of the night, visitations, angelic visitations, trances. (laughs) Lord, that you would speak supernaturally and through the word of God to us, that we would hear your voice, your sheep hear your voice, and we are your lambs. We are of your flock, Lord Jesus, and we want to hear you. We want to know you. We want to see you. We want divine encounters. So I pray for my friends, that you would release a a new and powerful revelation of your spirit and of your life to each one, that you would take us into the heavenly realm, show us our scrolls and our coals of fire Mm. until our lips burn in your presence. Mm. We love you, Jesus. We love everything about you. Mm. We love even the mysteries that we know so little of, but we love every part of you jesus we ask that you take our hearts take our lives let the words that we speak and the deeds of our life bring glory to you in jesus name amen 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 (laughs) thank you brian thank you so much yeah love you guys love you too too. derek always good to 
be back with you and please greet your wife and yeah. family and congregation I will. for us. You're so kind when we we're there. We, we had great conversations and, and Jason to meet you is an honor indeed. And thank uh, you. Yeah. Thank you for all that you're doing. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your friendship. Yeah. Hey guys, we're so glad that you are joining us for season two of Rethinking God with Tacos. Uh, you can find me, Derek Turner, at rivercharlotte.com. That's my church. And I'm on all the social medias yes. as Pastor Derek T. D-E-R-E-K, Pastor Derek T. Yeah, and uh, he's a Twitter savant. you got to follow him on Twitter. I'm also on Twitter uh, at Jason Clark is. Uh, and you can find all of these podcasts, including season one, on all of the platforms. You can also go to afamilystory.org, and everything's there. If you sign up for our mailing list, we send out a weekly email that has uh, articles, podcast information, and uh, we also let you know about new books coming out or events that we're uh, connected to. So yeah. uh, like, share, retweet, and, uh, and man, if you could write a review, it's it actually does something for the rankings. It, it, makes it does, it more available, yeah. So. But a five star review, of course. <laughs> yes. You know, if you can't write a five star review or something, <laughs> like just don't even write don't, a review. Don't worry, don't worry about it. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like if you can't say something nice, don't say anything, don't say anything, at, say anything all. at all. I, I like that. And then apply that to this <laughs> podcast, definitely. That's my motto. That's I like what it. I do. I love it. So, love you guys. Appreciate you coming on the ride with us. God bless. <laughs>